Welcome to another Pandemic Baseball Book Club conversation. My name is Ethel Bird Miller. Today I have the pleasure of talking with David Crow. David is the author of 1962, Baseball in America in the Time of JFK, a fascinating account of not simply baseball, but an overview of American culture in 1962. The book is published by the University of Nebraska Press. David, when people look back on the 60s, the year that seems to stand out, it's 1968. That was mm -hmm. the year we saw the Tet Offensive in Vietnam, the death of Martin Luther King Jr., RF Robert Kennedy, and also the urban riots. What right. attracted you to 1962? Exactly what you just said. It hadn't been done. 68 had been done. 67 had been done. 69 had been done. 61 had been done in baseball terms. Plenty of scholarship about Roger Maris. I had not seen anything about 62, and I was shocked because I started by chronicling the Mets and the Colt 45s, later the Astros. They both debuted that year. But in a writing workshop, the literary agent who taught the workshop said, books with broader topics get more readers. So I knew there were a few things, Ethelbert. I knew Car 54, Where Are You? Route 66, The Flintstones. I knew To Kill a Mockingbird came out that year. Advice and Consent came out that year. I did not know there were three Mercury missions. Mm -hmm. I knew about John Glenn. I did not know Carpenter and Shira also went up. I did not know about Kennedy giving the Rice University speech, we're going to the moon. I did not know that was 62. Mm -hmm. So there were so many storylines that I uncovered. I felt this had to be the path. And there's an old adage, as you know, in publishing, if you're looking for a book on a topic and you can't find it, that's the book you should write. Okay, I'll remember that. <laughs> okay. Now, I like how your prologue freezes time. Mm -hmm. You place this in the 1962 World Series between the Yankees and the Giants, seventh right. game, bottom of the ninth inning, uh, Willie McCovey at bat. Why did you begin with this moment? I like prologues. I like epilogues. There's differing... Uh, there are differing opinions about whether to put them in or not. But at heart, it's a baseball book. And it was an epic World Series. It came down to McCovey. And I wanted that drama in the beginning to kind of tease it. Because I knew there were plenty of readers who would remember 62. But I had hoped that there would be plenty of readers who were not alive and just were interested in history. So I wanted to kind of tease what would happen when McCovey was at bat. And that's why I call it McCovey at the bat, a takeoff on Casey at the bat. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I read it. I merely knew where I was at 12 years old. And mm -hmm. I was very happy that Bobby Richardson was the second baseman who caught the <laughs> uh, McCovey's bat. Uh, because I had been mourning at the beginning of the 60s with Bill Mazeroski hitting right. a home run. <laughs> so, you know, and, and I'm listening to radio. So, you know, it's not like it's a camera. I'm going to see the ball going into the glove. I'm waiting for it to be called. Right. But, um, you know, your, your, your book is well written in terms of the prologue. It pulls you in. But then you. when I looked at the beginning of this book, you're talking about the beginning of television. So I want you mm -hmm. to talk about the contribution of Milton Berle and how right. television began to change our nation. Well, Milton Berle was hired for, to host Texaco Star Theater in 1948, and he became television's first superstar. Television did exist commercially before that, but you had to be among the wealthy, and the programming was not so great, and it was sporadic. So Burl comes in, it goes mainstream, but you still had to be of some means to own a television set in 48. By the time we get to the 60s, Ethelbert, the, the price had come down. Mass production had been uh, honed, and everybody, it seems, has a television set. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was terribly important to put this year in context to not do a microscopic view of the baseball season, but also give you an overview and go as in-depth as I could on TV, films, politics, literature. I wanted to give you a slice of life. What was life like in 1962? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, when you mentioned television, I remember when color TV came in and, and my mother was saying, don't sit too close of it because of the radiation. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you know, so you go back to that. But along with television, um, your book also talks about um, the space program. 
Right. Um, you have um, you have mentioned uh, about Kennedy giving a speech at Rice University in, in Houston. Um, talk about the city of Houston, how it changes, uh, especially with NASA and the space program, and how the Colt Forty Five eventually become the Houston Astros. Well, Houston elevated because of the space program and the baseball team. There's no question about it. Saber has a national convention every year. When they had the convention in Houston, it changes from city to city every year. When it was in Houston, I took a break from the seminars and the lectures and I went to the University of Houston to research the George Kirksey archives. Kirksey was a public relations executive. He helped the Colt 45s get off the ground. And in his papers, there were demographic breakdowns and income projections, media analysis, uh, anything that you wanted to create a chronicle of the genesis of that team was there. Uh, the baseball team had to really show the city, the leagues, that Houston had the fan base, because that's what it comes down to, Ethelbert. It's fan the, base. Fan, can, will, will you sustain? Yeah, that's the problem here in Washington, D.C. Exactly. And it was for many years because Baltimore could Bigfoot Washington when right. the second incarnation of the senators left in the early 70s. I went to the University of Maryland and I remember all my fraternity brothers who were from the DC area, they rooted for the Orioles mm -hmm. because their parents remembered the senators, but they didn't have a team. Well, they had to prove in Houston that the fan base was enough to sustain TV coverage, radio coverage, and coming to the ballpark. And they were able to do that. And of course, when uh, NASA is escalating its efforts, then you have Houston in the byline of every space reporter in the country. So you get some innate marketing there or inherent marketing maybe is the proper right. word. Right. Well, you know, when you, when you look at this um, Houston Astros um, team, well, 45 and then the Astros, mm -hmm. uh, one thing that you do in your book, which I found very attractive and, and interesting to me, was you have these sort of mini profiles. Mm -hmm. And I want you to comment on, on two players that, that I sort of was following one because I guess the baseball card and one because I guess he might've been the best player on the team. And let's talk about Bob Astromonte and Rusty Staub. Oh, sure. Well, Rusty Staub was a bonus baby. I remember him from the seventies when he was with the Mets, but it seems that everywhere he went, he had a following. He was beloved in Montreal, in Detroit, in Houston, in New York. Uh, everybody loves Rusty. So I was really pleased to chronicle him uh, because I, I think he's an, a, an overlooked player in a, in a lot of ways. Oscar Monte gave me uh, an hour of his time and I mm. chronicled as fast as I could everything he was saying. He seemed to just be an ambassador, not only for the baseball team, but for the city of Houston. He loved the fans mm. and they really took to this team. Now, remember that the Houston Buffaloes, that franchise was in the minor leagues for quite some time. So the Buffalo's legacy lives on through the Astros, but the Buffalo's had to go by the wayside because you can't have a minor league and a major league team in a city, at least not at that time. Right, yeah. Well, along with the Astros, the, the, well, the 45s and the Astros, uh, 1962, we all see the, the rise of the Mets, um, the amazing mm -hmm. Mets, as Casey Stang would say. Um, and it, it brings baseball back to National League Baseball back to New York. Yeah. Now, two people that I, that I like, <laughs> one was Mar uh, Martha Murray and, and Eddie Crane, and Cr Eddie Cranepool, if you could talk sure. about those, those two early myths. Well, marvelous Marv Throneberry is an icon in pop culture, not only for the Mets, but through the beer commercials right. for Miller Lite. And when I told people I was writing a book about 62 and the Mets would have a chapter, all of my baseball history friends said, you're not gonna write another essay about Marv Throneberry, are you? <laughs> there are too many. And I said, no, he'll have a section, but I'm trying to chronicle as many players as I could, because even if these players were only in 30 games, mm -hmm. they started this thing. You know, they, without them, there wouldn't be a New York Mets ball club. So I thought it was incumbent upon me to, talk about the players as much as I could with the Colt 45s and the Mets because they started this new era in both, uh, in, in both cities. Now, Crane Pool was interesting because I remember being a kid rooting for the Mets and he was the longest serving member from the 62 squad. Mm -hmm. And that's his distinction from that team. Right. You know, um, 
On May 5th, 1962, Bo Belinsky throws a no-hitter for the Los Angeles Angels against the Baltimore Orioles. What mm -hmm. happens after that day? Well, Bo Belinsky is a tragic figure. I took to that storyline right away when I did some digging. He, uh, he had the life of Riley, to use somewhat of an outdated term. He, he just had the world at his fingertips. He threw the no-hitter. He's 26 years old. He's in L.A., and the gateway is open to the high life. He dates Hollywood actresses. Everywhere he goes, people buy him drinks, buy him dinner. Every, everyone wants to be around him. And he wasn't a great pitcher. I mean, 2851 lifetime, Ethelbert, hardly right. all of fame. You, you don't get tenure with that in the academy. <laughs> but Right. But if you talk to people who were around at that time and you talk about the other four guys who threw a no-hitter, it's doubtful that those people will remember the pitchers. You mentioned Bo Belinsky. They remember the one out of the out of the you know, several guys who threw a no-no, they remember Polinsky because he was engaged to Mamie Van Doren. He had three marriages that went bust. And he was a very prominent celebrity. And then he had some demons, mm -hmm. alcohol, addiction. And it wasn't until the 90s where he started to come out of it, uh, thanks to a car dealership in Las Vegas that expanded into several uh, franchises in the Mountain States region. And this car dealership, Findlay, uh, took him under their wing, specifically a guy I mentioned in the book, Rich Abajan, who was a UNLV fullback. And even though Rich was younger than Bo, Bo looked up to him as a father figure and Rich could talk to Bo mm -hmm. athlete to athlete in a way that nobody else could. Mm -hmm. And the people, Ethelbert, who knew Bo in Vegas at that time they said we had heard about the Bo Belinsky that you know, but we know a different Bo Belinsky. He was, he was quieter, he was more courtly, he was trying to get his life in order. And, and he was from Trenton. I grew up in Northern New Jersey, an hour away. So I, I was drawn to that part of it. And when I dug a little deeper, Ethelbert, I found out he did not have a great home life. He was a teenager in pool halls hustling pool as a teenager when other kids are playing baseball for the American Legion team or going to the prom or studying for college. He's out there hustling pool as a teenager. So it's a really hard scrabble life. And when he got to LA, my goodness, I, the, the high life is there waiting for him after he throws the no hitter. Mm, yeah. Well, along with him, um, you also have in your book, uh, Marilyn, Marilyn Monroe. Uh, who mm -hmm. dies in, in 1962. She's 36 right. years old. How did this movie star change America? And she married oh. Joe DiMaggio in 1954, a marriage that lasted less than a year. Right. I was wondering, like, when you look at this marriage in your book, is this to show that connection between baseball and popular culture? Well, there wasn't too much. Uh, when, I, when I set out to write the book, I knew Marilyn Monroe was going to be in it. And then I was overwhelmed because what can I say about her that hasn't already been said? Mm -hmm. So I decided to go a, a novel route and I interviewed a woman who portrayed Marilyn in the 80s and 90s. She became the Marilyn go-to portrayer. And I talked a little bit about her iconography, uh, how people painted her. Of course, there's a, a, an intersection because of DiMaggio and there's a famous quote, it might be apocryphal, but uh, Marilyn Monroe went to Korea to perform for the soldiers and she came back and she said, Joe, you can't believe the reception I got. You have no idea what it's like when thousands of people yell your name. <laughs> he says, yeah, I do. Right. Yeah. And it, it Every was, at bat. <laughs> right. And, and it was a tragedy that, that she died at 36. Right. And this was a, this was a year where there was optimism mm -hmm. and there was tragedy and there was worry, which I'm sure we'll talk about later with the mm -hmm. Cuban Missile Crisis. Right. So it was a fascinating year in American history where optimism was at its highest, I believe, mm -hmm. but you, you have to counter that with some of the bad stuff that happened that year. 
Right. You have many profiles in, in your book, and I would very encourage people to, to read it because there's going to be someone in there that you're going to say, oh, wow, I want to know more about. So I just yeah. want to ask you about two other people who, sure. when I was reading the book, um, I really was drawn to. One I knew, the other I really didn't know. And, and talk about Jim Julia Gilliam, who played for the Dodgers. I knew him. Sure. But then also talk about Sherry Chesser, who mm. was a host of um, Romper Room. Right. Well, Jim Gilliam died right around the 1978 World Series. He's one of the unsung heroes of the Dodgers, uh, just a, a, a cornerstone of those Dodgers lineups from the 50s and 60s, more of a, a quiet leader, I would say, not as uh, outspoken as Jackie Robinson, more in the Roy Campanella mode. Of, you know, I'm just happy to be here. I just want to play my job or do my job, play ball. That's what I want to do. And um, I'm fascinated by him. I, someday there'll have to be a book about Junior Gilliam. He, he's one of these folks that kind of flies under the radar, uh, much like a Tommy Davis or Willie Davis, where you get overshadowed by a Koufax or a Drysdale. Right. Sherry Chesson, my goodness, uh, Sherry is a heroine, in my opinion. She, her story deserved to be told. Romper Room was a kid's show that was franchised. It wasn't syndicated. So for people who don't know, it's much like a McDonald's restaurant. If you buy a McDonald's franchise, you, it's that hamburger, that filet of fish will taste the same in Peoria as it's going to taste in Poughkeepsie. So you have to follow a certain format. Same thing with Romper Room. They had songs, they had a, a lesson plan for the kids, they had games, and each city had a host. So she was the host in Arizona and she had taken thalidomide. And when she found out about the severe birth defects that thalidomide caused, she talked to a reporter. Now, she did not want her name known. The reporter outed her and she becomes a pariah. She becomes a, a person in the headlines. This local celebrity becomes an international household word or name and abortion is not legal. And you know, you're talking about thalidomide causing fetuses that have one arm, that have just a head and a torso. I mean, the really brutal stuff that even uh, pro-life, uh, you know, activists will will probably turn ahead and say, "Wait a minute, let, maybe we need to rethink this." Right. And and her doctor said, "You know, it, it's not the, the fetus won't live. If it lives, it's going to be painful at most a day." And she had to leave the country to get this procedure. She went to Sweden, right? She went to Sweden. And that story was told in a Sissy Space Act TV movie. But I got the feeling that there was more to be told. And she was extraordinarily patient with me. Uh, her story isn't that well known now. And that's a big reason I wanted to highlight it. Because you know, you're talking about the profiles. When's the last time Rusty Staub was profiled or Junior Gilliam? or some of the other players that I mentioned, but it didn't just go with baseball. It went with Sherry, Dr. Mary Early, first black graduate at the University of Georgia. I talk about her quite a bit. Uh, these people deserved to have their story told. And I am so thankful and privileged that they decided to share their stories with me. So you've done an excellent job, uh, David. Thank you. Um, let's return to the seventh game of the World Series in, in okay. 1962. You write, and I'm gonna put you on the spot here, that the seventh game of the World Series has no parallel. Can you back that up? Well, sure. Hey, baseball is a slow moving game. You saw what happened in the Field of Dreams game the other night. It is a slow moving game. And for people who say there's nothing going on, there's always something going on. Outfielders shift, infielders shift, a uh, pitcher goes to the rosin bag or walks around the mound. There's always something different that's happening. Now, I will caution by saying back then games were a lot quicker right. but there are a lot of reasons for that that we can talk about another time uh, they weren't three hours in most cases they were maybe two and a half two hours 40 minutes etc uh, there's just an anticipation building and also back then it was the national pastime i don't know if that's still true hopefully the field of dreams game elevated the sport but that was a special occasion Football had taken over by the 90s because of the TV packages. The NBA used to air its championships on tape delay at 1130 on CBS. Well, now it's a primetime spectacle. So and the NBA has 
really taken a hold in merchandising and stardom, et cetera. Uh, but baseball back then, Ethelbert, was the point of conversation when you're talking about sports. Mm -hmm. You know, I go back to your, your prologue and I mentioned how it sort of freezes time. Uh, what I find very interesting, uh, if you hold that concept up, if you look at, at 62, immediately after the World Series, we're dealing with a missile crisis as if the entire world is frozen and, and waiting in anticipation. Right. Talk about, you know, the, the missile crisis and how you see that coming after the World Series. Well, that is probably the darkest moment in American history because America is sitting on the precipice. And when the president of the United States says, if Russia launches the miss missiles from Cuba, if, uh, or well, Cuba and Russia, they were partners. So if Cuba launches the missiles, we're going to respond. And that would cause a tremendous rift with the Soviet Union. Cuba is only 90 miles. And you're talking about a time when only five or six years before, people were going to Cuba on vacation. Right. When Castro came in, the, the premise was he would open everything up. There would be a dialogue between the US and Cuba. And that obviously never happened. My favorite part of the, the segment on the Cuban Missile Crisis, Ethelbert, is the conversation between Eisenhower and Kennedy, right. which you can find on YouTube. And it's so current. It happens just a few hours before Kennedy gives the speech. And it's, it's a peek into what I believe to be the beginning of the ex-presidents club. Mm -hmm. That's a real thing that uh, Obama dispatched president, uh, former mm -hmm. president, or was it? Uh, mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. or, yeah, dispatched his father and Bill Clinton for tsunami relief mm -hmm. and, and so forth. And they call each other for advice or for uh, you know, help with charitable endeavors like that. And uh, that's, a, that's a real thing. I think it began when you had this young president uh, seeking the counsel of a guy who was a generation ahead of him. Right. They both had seen war. Eisenhower had prosecuted World War II. He became the head of the Allied forces. Kennedy was injured in the PT-109 accident. So they knew the cost right. of war. And to hear Kennedy talking to Eisenhower uh, and, and hear Eisenhower lay out his vision of what the Russians might do, what they might not do, why he thinks that way, what Kennedy is thinking, what Kennedy is strategizing. Um, it's like a real life version of the West Wing. Mm -hmm. And I wish that we had that. I don't think we have that anymore. I wish that we did. Right. Well, you know, one of the things we, we had, and, and you bring this out in your, your book, uh, with the astronauts becoming very popular in the early 60s, yeah. um, Everybody seemed like they had a little buzz cord. Well, not African Americans, but <laughs> they had a little buzz cord. And it was a certain way that you know people were imitating the, the hairstyle. And I find it also interesting. In 1962, we have the arrival of the Beatles with the long right. hair. So right. uh, just talk about we'll have to get to the end of our, our conversation. Talk about how the the, the, the Beatles come in and then um, the, um, the Beach Boys come in. You know, all of right. this is happening in 62. Well, the Beatles certainly uh, debuted in 62. They became, uh, they, they came here in 64 for their first American TV appearance. Beach Boys had their first song debuted in 1962. Uh, that set off a surfing explosion. The Beatles set off the British invasion where you had uh, the Rolling Stones and some other groups come in. So the 60s was such a, a panorama, for lack of a better word, of different styles. You had Motown, you had folk, you had hard rock, you had surfing, you had the bubblegum groups, you had the girl groups, uh, you had the, the British sound and so forth. And there, there's, there's no parallel in any, uh, you know, any decade that had that kind of diversity right. where you could point to the charts and say, oh my God, look at all these different types of, of music. With the astronauts, well, as you know, Ethelbert, uh, look at the 1960s roster of pop culture, and it's littered with space-themed space offering. Right. TV, right. My Favorite Martian, Lost right. in Space, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> right. I, dream, I Dream of Genie. Right. And, and a lot of movies in the 60s were based on the astronaut theme or the space theme. A lot of Twilight Zone episodes mm -hmm. had a space theme to them. 
So it was that kind of a, of a, of a thing that captured the American public, especially kids, in a way that I don't think has ever been seen since and certainly not before. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, when one gets to the end of your book, it seems like there's something that you comment on that, that seems 62 really elevated. You, you, you pretty much say that 1962 was the best year ever for film. Mm-hmm. And you're making reference to you know, To Kill a Mockingbird, you know, Lawrence of Arabia. You know, these these are classic films all yeah. coming out in that same year. And when I when I read your book, uh, it seems as if your your love of baseball sort of get, flows into this love of film. You know that, yeah. that we could have had a, an entire book uh, on these movies. Absolutely, no question. My favorite political movie of all time is Advice and Consent. It, right. And it, if you see the movie, you got to read the novel. Mm-hmm. It's it's just so compelling. And To Kill a Mockingbird, uh, How the West Was Won, the other ones you mentioned, Days, and Wine, Days of Wine and Roses. Right. Jack which is a yeah. brutal, brutal look at alcoholism mm-hmm. and how he is really a social drinker and Lee Remick plays his wife. And at the beginning, she wants nothing to do with alcohol. And then she kind of gets sucked into this vortex that it, it doesn't look like she can get out of. Mm-hmm. He has some stutter steps in terms of getting to a, a right. point of recovery and you're left wondering, will she follow suit? Mm-hmm. And it, it's so heartbreaking. And Lee Remick is another one of those underrated actresses that you just don't hear about enough. Well, talking about heartbreak, and this is my last question, um, sure. David, um, deals with heartbreak. You have a next book coming out from University of Nebraska Press. And as you said earlier in this program, um, you know, you're in New Jersey, Right, which is, you know, across the Hudson River. But you are going to do a book on the cultural history of the Red Sox. Explain that to me. <laughs> well, the Red Sox, it's- No, no, just say- explain it. I mean, how, you know, you, you're just talking about this geographical relationship between- the Oh, well, and well I, I, again, back to what I said before, you, you're looking for something that hasn't been done. And I right. love pop culture. I'm a pop culture guy. I'm, a, I, I'm very much interested, if not fascinated, by the interrelationship between baseball and these different uh, levels. Uh, the, the people ask me all the time, what, what team do you root for? You write about right. baseball, what team do you root for? Well, right. I, since a little kid, I root for the Mets, but I'm really a fan of whatever team I'm writing about at right. the time. So when I go to Boston, which will inevitably happen, I will be a Red Sox fan as I'm researching photos of the Huntington Avenue grounds and Fenway Park at the Boston Library. Uh, You know, this is going to take some time because I really want to talk to the Bostonians and New Englanders about their love of the Red Sox. Mm -hmm. And what are the depictions in popular culture of the Red Sox that they like or don't like? Well, are you Um, going to call your book Taters? (laughs) I'm I'm going to call my book whatever (laughs) University of Nebraska Press wants me to call my book. I so like taters, I, man. <laughs> I, I, I can I can make suggestions, but uh, they have the final say, and I trust them implicitly. So I, I, it's a fascinating thing to me because New England is such a uh, it's it's tribal. I mean the, these these sports. Uh, okay, we'll finish it again. What I often chuckle at is the Red Sox curse since right. Abe Ruth was sold. That's what we just had. This interruption was a Red Sox curse. <laughs> Uh, the, the Red Sox curse of Babe Ruth leaving the uh, leaving for the Yankees and the Red Sox not winning another World Series for decades, coming close a couple of times. But it's not like they were devoid of excellence. They had the Bruins, they had the the uh, the Celtics. So it's just the, this baseball team that's so enamored enamored of the city and and vice versa. Uh, you know, enamored by the city rather. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and the city loves the Red Sox and mm-hmm. Fenway Park is more than a hundred years old and has so much history. So well, that, that's that, what I'm, right. doing. I'm certain that people also will love your book because if they love, you know, 1962, they'll be looking forward to this book on the Red Sox. And I'm very happy. I think that, um, you know, you'll probably become like a franchise player for the University of Nebraska Press. <laughs> you can only got a good player. You can build a whole, a whole, a whole catalog around you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, I hope to, you know, continue this conversation. Um, I, I really enjoyed your book. And just to have an opportunity to talk with you this afternoon has been a real pleasure. Likewise. I appreciate it.